baffling readiness to accept a lot of economic pain because of a perceived threat to identity. Uh, who would have thought it, eh? Um, but thank you very much to the IIEA for hosting today's event and to Ed for writing this paper for the Centre for European Reform. Could have published it anywhere, so we're very grateful for that, Ed. It's always nice coming over here, but I confess to finding the current circumstances a little bit difficult. It's hard not to be reminded of the old joke of God and uh, Archangel Michael talking about the creation of Ireland when God says, and here's the Emerald Isle, this is going to be the, uh, the most glorious spot on earth with beautiful mountains, rivers, lakes, exquisite coastline, peopled by poets and playwrights and songwriters to which uh, Michael answers, balance, God, there needs to be some balance. And God replies, you haven't seen those yet, I'm putting next door. <laughs> and uh, I think there is um, something uh, to that at the moment. It is, it is disturbing how little attention is being paid in Britain to the implications of what's happening on Ireland. However, I don't think it should be that surprising because the Eurosceptics are not really paying that much attention to the implications for Britain either, be they on the economic side or, or on the foreign policy side or generally just in terms of the country's kind of position in the world. Now I'm going to say a few, word about, a few words about the UK's um, position papers that uh, were published over the summer, the likelihood of a compromise on uh, citizens' rights, uh, the possible compromise on money and a transition agreement, and then on the ECJ and Ireland, and where we are present on the future relationship, such as it's possible to say. Now, EU officials clearly understand that those position papers were for domestic consumption, that they were issued as a way of trying to unite a cabinet which is deeply split. But what frustrates uh, the Commission is that they mix up Article 50, the transition and the future arrangement, to which the British officials reply, well, of course they do, because you can't separate the three things. Now, the common theme, says the Commission, is that they're still trying to find ways of retaining most of the benefits uh, while cutting out the ECJ, which is essentially what many Eurosceptics are still trying uh, to achieve. And the Commission is particularly hostile to the two papers that look at customs and Northern Ireland. Now, the Irish paper, which proposes no borders, but doesn't say how, uh, has drawn particular criticism in Brussels and raised the suspicion there that the government, the British government, is basically trying to set the EU up as a scapegoat for the reimposition of border controls because they know how badly that will play in, in Britain and how much damage it will do to, anger, to, to British Irish relations, and they're trying to line the, the Commission up as a scapegoat. Clearly, it won't work, but that's, a, that's their interpretation of it. For Brussels, neither of those two papers in particular, they're not happy about any of the papers really, but those two papers in particular show any understanding that the EU side has its own needs and pressures. So e.g. on the risk of smuggling on the border here, but more, more broadly on its own legal order and on the policing of the rules of the customs union in the single market. What frustrates them most is just the lack of understanding running through those papers of the political realities facing the EU side. So according to one commission official that I spoke to recently, the customs paper suggests the British don't understand the cust that customs controls are about enforcing the EU's regulatory union. The paper ignores services and regulations entirely, which is right, it does. Option two of the customs paper, according to which there would be no border controls anywhere, basically, and that each party would police each other's customs rules, is basically seen as a joke in Brussels. It's, not, it's really not taken seriously uh, by anyone. Even officials who are typically quite sympathetic uh, to the UK, uh, are scathing. And one couple of weeks said to me, this is mad, ridiculous, magic thinking, because it relies on technology that simply doesn't exist and ignores the politics. Um, I think the blunt truth is, and we can come back to this, talk about this later, if Britain really does leave the customs union and, uh, and the single market, I think we are looking at uh, hard controls on the Irish border, at, um, unfortunately, much as um, I'd hate to see that happen. Um, Moreover, any trade deal that the UK strikes, say, with the US, will be done entirely on US terms. So the US will demand that the UK signs up to its sanitary and phytosanitary standards, etc., etc. That will mean problems for trading agricultural products across uh, the Irish border. Britain is going to be a rule taker in any trade negotiation with a big country such as the US. Now, is there divergence between the Commission and the Council 
on the Brexit process. Now, the UK makes the point that rows over money are typically addressed by heads of state and not, uh, and not by the Commission liaising with uh, uh, the country in question. Is it possible that the Council will intervene to force uh, a compromise on, say, money, etc.? Um, I think some Council officials think it will. They argue, they agree with the British that the um, Commission's mandate restricts its room for manoeuvre. It's basically working with a, within a mandate designed for trade negotiations with a third party, not for, the, not for negotiating exit with one of its own members. However, the Commission strongly disagrees uh, with this analysis, arguing that there's no divergence between itself and the member states. Uh, and on the face of it, there is something to that. I mean, we might see differences coming out once uh, we've got over the initial kind of hump. But there is broad agreement among uh, the member states, although money, of course, does have a, a tendency uh, to bring out differences. So we'll see how that proceeds. Um, the British think they will get what they want on, on citizen rights. So that would mean basically that the EU accepts reciprocity, i.e. that EU citizens in Britain will be subject to UK law uh, and, that, uh, and that that will be less advantageous to them than the rights that British people living elsewhere in the EU will enjoy because they will be subject to, to, um, to they will be treated as EU citizens, so their rights will actually be stronger. Now, the EU side has resisted that for obvious reasons, uh, but the British side is, is, is fairly confident that they can get that through and that there will be no resort uh, to the ECJ to enforce those rights in the UK. I'm sceptical. Uh, I think there is one way of reconciling it, perhaps, which would be for uh, the withdrawal treaty, Britain's withdrawal treaty from the EU, to include a very detailed agreement on the rights of EU citizens in the UK, and that those rights um, would be directly enforceable in UK courts, but they'd be traced to that withdrawal treaty. That might be, might be um, some way around it, um, which could meet EU fears that the British Parliament could damn it, could change its legislation over time and denude people of rights. This is a tricky one, but I think, you know, we might, I think a deal is to be done, but it's not clear, it's not entirely clear. I mean, both sides see the deal that needs to be done on money and on transition. I mean, senior figures in both the Council and the Commission agree with the UK that there is a way of solving this problem. I think basically Britain needs to sign up to a transition deal and pay perhaps 10 billion euros a year into, into the budget. Uh, now, 30 billion would cover most of the unspent budgetary commitments. Uh, the EU claims the UK owes it, and they would still be haggling over pension rights, contingent liabilities, etc. But those could be um, addressed uh, by specialist committees. There's a sequencing issue here, but there is a deal to be done. Uh, although it will require the UK uh, to put some significant money on the table. Um, the UK thinks some of the top council people see this and would be happy uh, for phase one of the talks to cover the transition arrangements, but they would have to, they understand that they're going to have to put some money on the table. The problem is differences within the government, as we saw graphically illuminated at the weekend. Um, and this deal requires the UK government to appear at least to be speaking as one and to be acting um, in good faith. On money, ironically, some of the fiercest criticism of the UK is actually coming from countries that have traditionally been its closest allies, i.e. other net contributors to the EU budget, who are fearful of paying more money. So some of the, the biggest criticism of, of, of the position that Britain has staked out on the money is actually coming from the Netherlands and the Nordics, which is... Um, only goes to, serve to highlight how isolated Britain now is within the EU, that its closest allies are some of its fiercest critics. Uh, money, of course, is not the only difficulty. If Britain does go for a transition agreement, which I think is, is all but certain, it will basically be a continuation of the status quo, but with no vote. Uh, it will be an off-the-shelf transition agreement, so membership of the single market, ECJ, free movement. Um, now... There is an understanding, certainly among most of the cabinet in the UK, certainly by May and Hammond and David Davis, that that is the only transition deal the EU is going to offer. But of course, 
the cabinet is not is not united on this, and it, at the moment, I think it's a brave person that states with any confidence uh, how that's going to pan out over the next uh, weeks and months. I think it's quite clear that for sufficient progress to have been made, um, come the meeting in October, uh, the money issue will have to be, if not settled, but will progress, significant progress will have to be made over the next uh, few weeks. The British side thinks it will be, the EU side is much more pessimistic. The Commission has, however, shifted its line on the transition. It used to be, you know, we cannot even talk about this until uh, we know the shape of the ultimate relationship, the long-term relationship. That's gone. I think now they just want um, uh, some sort of vague discussion of the future relationship. What they really want is Article 50 sorted, the money on the table, and an off-the-shelf transition agreement. They know that not, probably it's highly, highly unlikely that more, than, that, that more than that can be agreed by March uh, 2019. There just isn't enough time. Yeah? Um, now, both sides would have an incentive to portray that transition deal as time-limited. Uh, two to three years. The UK government, for obvious reasons, they want to claim, want to be able to claim that uh, everything will be resolved before the next general election, which has to be held in uh, May or June uh, 2022. But it's impossible really to see that, how that could come about. I mean, the, the internal discussions that people are having, including us with the Treasury in the UK and everyone else, is that they think five years is the absolute minimum needed to establish the IT and infrastructure for, for, for customs uh, posts in the UK. Um, they just don't have the resources, and nothing vaguely comparable has ever been attempted. And the idea that it could be done in 24 months is just, or 36, is just simply not seen as, as very plausible. Um, so that really, to be honest, that alone makes talk of no deal a bit fatuous, unless you're prepared to create a huge financial crisis uh, and legal chaos, really. Um, the EU line is that the transition has to be short to prevent the EU staying in the EU by the back door, Britain staying in the EU by the back door, having its cake and eating, etc. To be honest, I don't find that very credible. Uh, a transition deal that leaves Britain in the single market, subject to the ECJ and freedom of movement, paying into the budget but having no say over anything is not the kind of deal anybody else wants. Uh, that's not attractive to anybody else. Um, and the money would come very would come in useful. Britain would continue. If it's five years, six years, then obviously Britain would continue paying into the EU budget at something comparable to the first three years, so 10 billion a year. I don't think that would be insurmountable. I think uh, that would be acceptable to people. Um, the EU line on dispute settlement and courts is also becoming clearer. Uh, most uh, well on the future relationship, most people on the EU side could live with a new institution modelled on the EFTA court. Uh, the recent paper, the recent UK paper on dispute settlement is the one that's seen a bit more positively since it implies Britain could accept a role uh, for the ECJ so long as it has no direct jurisdiction. This does open the way to the UK agreeing to submit disputes to something similar to the EFTA court. So um, whose opinions on the interpretation of EU rules are advisory formally, but of course they're not really advisory. I mean, in Norway's case, uh, uh, you know, in theory they could dis disregard them, but they never do because if they were to do that, it would call into question their membership of the single market. But for British political purposes, that might be a way of fudging things and engineering one of the many face-saving uh, um, sort of exercises that would be necessary in order for the country to kind of retreat. Okay, the future relationship between the UK and the EU. Now, both sides claim that the other doesn't know what it wants, and both say the other's wrong. Um, Britain talks of reducing, this is terms of the long-term relationship, talks about reducing friction at borders through negotiating many mutual recognition agreements, whereby each side recognises the other side's standards. Now, as we all know, the EU side has said that won't ensure frictionless trade. Um, these such agreements, one could see them covering the automotive sector, pharma, one or two others, but not everything. There's no free trade agreement in the world that has MRAs for all goods, and then, we, then it leaves side services as well. So it, there's an awful lot of uncertainty there. And from the EU side, their argument is, look, if we give the UK MRAs on everything, we fear it will change its rules over time uh, and, and gain advantage, hence. Uh, and it falls foul of their determination for Brexit uh, to, to carry a price. 
um, which raises the prospect that um, it won't just be leaving the customs union that will necessitate uh, an EU-UK border or border controls, but also leaving the single market. Uh, that leaving the single market will also necessitate those. Um, I think the EU will insist that any FTA allows the EU to punish the UK for undercutting uh, social tax and environmental standards. Uh, but of course, no one knows quite yet how that will work. Uh, it's very difficult to know how that would work in practice. I mean, in short, I think a lengthy, given the sheer complexity of all of this, I think a lengthy transition is more likely than not. Um, but it, there are other questions. I mean, is it possible that Britain could still salvage its, salvage its membership? Lots of people, not least in the UK, still hope uh, that there could be some, some way out of this. Um, the Tories know that working, walking away with no deal is, is not really a credible threat. I mean, there are a couple of headbangers. Um, you'll probably know some of the names, someone like Jacob rees who really don't care. Just any chance of getting Britain as, out as soon as possible is enough. He doesn't really care what the impact on the Conservative Party or his own seat or the country is. But most of them, even the, the really sort of quite doctrinaire ones, the Liam Foxes and, and David Davises and people, they know that walking away is, is not credible. Uh, they know that a definitive breakdown of negotiations, so long as it happened a good time before the end of the Article 50 negotiations, uh, would lead to a huge financial crisis, uh, almost certainly a fresh election in the UK. Um, it's very hard in those circumstances to see how the Tories wouldn't get um, badly, badly damaged at that election. It would be very hard to, to distance themselves from the, the economic damage having been caused. Um, and we would have almost certainly a it would be a Labour-led government, whether that would be Labour in coalition with the Lib Dems and the SNP would depend, obviously, on the, on the arithmetic. Um, but such a government, depending on how vague Labour had been in the election campaign over Brexit, would open up the possibility of Britain applying for an extension, either of the Article 50 negotiations or uh, to revoking Article 50. Now... I think the EU would certainly allow it to extend. Would, what kind of reception would Britain get if it applied to revoke? Um, I think it would probably happen. I mean, obviously, the longer they leave it, the harder it's going to be. But notwithstanding the huge frustration with the UK, particularly with the Conservative Party uh, and the country's media, there isn't really much to be gained from Britain leaving the EU for anybody. Um, and it would be a huge propaganda coup, let's face it, for the EU, uh, if Britain turned around and did that. Clearly, they would extract their pound of flesh, the rebate would go, various other things would go. I don't think anyone would put Britain under any pressure to join the euro, notwithstanding what Mr Juncker said last week. But uh, I still think but there would be concessions, but I think uh, they would probably be allowed to revoke. Um, could Britain rejoin from the transition period? I think this is possible uh, and much more likely than Britain revoking and staying in the EU uh, because of the democratic legitimacy issue. It would be much easier to address that issue if Britain reapplied to join. Um, I don't think this is beyond the realms of possibility. It's sometimes hard at the moment not to despair about uh, what's happening in the UK. Um, but the demographics of the country do point to a, a strongly pro-EU electorate going forward, um, which is easily forgotten uh, given what's been happening. Um, and I think Britain joining from the transition status is as likely as Britain exiting the transition into some kind of very poor FTA. Um, I'm not, I don't know what the probabilities are, but I, I think there is a chance that, you know, it won't happen at all, although I think that's slim. I think there's a significant chance that Britain will end up reapplying, uh, although albeit on less advantageous terms, uh, and an equally significant chance that Britain it will indeed end up leaving entirely into some kind of not particularly attractive FDA, which would have huge implications here, obviously. Um, I mean, if I had to bet one way or the other whether Britain will be in the EU in 15 years' time, I would, if I had to bet one way or the other, I'd say yes, it will be. Um, but only after having done an awful lot of damage to Britain and, uh, and a number of others, uh, not least here. <laughs>